Linda Bean from the Kellyanne Dolan Memorial Fund. Um, thank you for joining us for our Wednesday segment, Shining a Light. Boy, do we need it more than ever today. It's uh, pretty dark out there. And I'm so excited to welcome two guests, two friends of mine today to talk about an important topic. Um, Bev Weinberg is the Executive Director from Integrate for Good. Welcome, Bev. Thank you, great to be here. She'll tell us a little bit about her organization later on. And my friend, Nikisha Black. Hi, Nikisha. Hello, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for being here. Nikisha is the transition coordinator for special needs students with the Upper Dublin School District. So delighted to have you both and, and get into what I think is a really important topic and hopefully link some of the families out there that are maybe feeling a little bit alone um, with the element of COVID and virtual schooling and the lack of, you know, opportunities to engage their transitional age student, whether it be in a volunteer setting, a work setting, um, or just day-to-day -day school. But, you know, I think maybe we should start by framing. Nikisha, if you don't mind, let's talk about, when I throw that phrase out there, transitional aged special need youth, that's, that's a mouthful. What am I talking about? We're talking about students 18 to 21 and beyond who are transitioning out of traditional school and moving into a community environment, working, socialization, and really interacting with peers in the community. Most parents don't want their students or their young people to be clients. They want them to be citizens and fully engaged within our community. So when we look at transitional age, we're looking at fully engaging young people um, in the realm of special needs within all communities, whether they're working, they're socially hanging out. And with COVID, it has been, uh, you know, it's been a little bit intense for students to not be able to engage. I can imagine so. You know, we, we are so grateful to be a partner with the Upper Dublin School District. Um, over the last couple of years, we have had three students um, in turn work in our office as part of the community um, work-based learning, which, you know, a tremendous opportunity for us and for these students who just have, and I know I'm gonna get Bev to chime in, chime in because I was using the phrase special needs, but I really prefer um, students with unique and special abilities. You can see our friends there Zizi, Tyler, and Jack from Upper Dublin. We had them front and center in our holiday program, um, working on a craft, helping out. Um, they were just such a tremendous asset. So Bev, color the language a little bit. Let's get away from special needs. Tell me what's, what's, what's happening in the world. Sure, um, and what I like to share, I actually learned from Jenny Levy, who is one of our Integrate for Good board members, and she lives with an intellectual disability and, and some serious medical, um, some health concerns. And she told me that she does not like the word special. And I grew up using the word special. I spent 25 years working as a school-based occupational therapist in special education. So I was a coach with Special Olympics. So special was just something I would say all the time. and. Jenny, you know, lucky for me, shared her perspective and she said, you know, I don't like the word special. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. You know, can you tell me why? Because I never saw that, you know, I saw other, like, we don't use words like mental retardation. Like there are certain words we don't use, but special is a word that we use all the time. And I said, you know, please share with me your perspective on that. And she said, when you call me special, other people don't think they're special enough to be my friend, to ask me to walk around the mall, to hire me, to, you know, just to be with me, to just do everyday things. So when I'm labeled special and they see, you know, maybe a job coach or a direct support professional or somebody alongside me, they think, oh, somebody must be specially trained to interact with that person. Uh -huh. And that word special, she helped me understand, does in some ways become a barrier so out of respect for Jenny's perspective, and because she is one of our valued board members, I took it out of my vocabulary because she educated me. Now, does everybody feel that way about the word special? Of course not. 
Um, but we, um, we refer to people by their name. One time Jenny was doing um, a presentation with me and it was on disability etiquette. And someone from a company said, you know, what should we call you? Do you like diverse ability, special needs, special ability, disability? She said, you can just call me Jenny. <laughs> and that is what I find that most transition age students and adults want is they want what everyone wants. They want to belong. They want opportunities to work and to socialize, as Nikisha said. So sometimes we get caught up in the jargon, but I feel it's more important just to, um, you know, create opportunities in our community so people can get more fully engaged and ask people, you know, just be open. You know, I don't want to offend you. You know what, you know, we try to avoid that terminology and treat people as people. And you know, why does there even need to be a term? You're talking about, let's just drop the label and see you as a person. Yeah, and sometimes, you know, it gets complicated because people need to qualify for certain right. services and things like that. Um, but in general, for the general public to understand, most people don't want to be labeled. They want op the same opportunities that everybody has, right. everyone else has right. in our community. And Jenny really enlightened me on that. So I'm, I'll always be grateful for her perspective. That's awesome. Well, let's get in and talk about some of the, the, the opportunities. Nikisha, talk about the impact of COVID and kids being out of the school setting for the most part. Um, what are you doing? What is the district doing to keep these folks um, engaged in a volunteer or work-based site or just being able to be socially engaged with their, their peers? Great. We have a few outlets which we've been using since the springtime. Um, one of the biggest pieces for our students um, that I meet with, especially our students that are aging out, is a socialization piece, which is the final chapter. We've taught them how to work. We've taught them how to engage with their colleagues. Um, with the COVID shutdown March the 12th, we had to pull all of our students. We have about 27 students that's involved um, in our community work-based learning program from Wawa to Wait Coffee to Kellyanne Dolan Foundation. And, um, We've had to pull that, so we were hoping to be able to get back in the community. Since we were not able to get back into the community um, through virtual learning, we have weekly um, and almost daily social skills groups with some of the students because they can't have their hangouts anymore, but they still want that social piece. So I'll run guided groups with those guys. For our kids who really need that community engagement or work-based learning, we are able to provide contactless work-based learning projects. So one of our big projects were voter registration bags where um, we noticed that lines were gonna be long through the selection process. So I had students in our life skills program and some of my um, older students who work in the community put together snack bags with cookies and peanut butter crackers and mints and water. And then I have some seniors for their community project will be going to voter polls and passing those out. And we also partnered with Cheryl Rice with the You Matter Foundation. And my kids put together 100,000 cards, which is about 10,000 packets that will be mailed um, to let people in the community know that you matter. So we put together bags and I dropped them off at the houses and picked them back up. So we're able to still kind of um, owning on the skills in which they have, but they're just not able to go out to work. So we bring work in house. So they're working from home is the model that we've taught them now. Yeah, and that that's incredible, keeping them engaged and also, you know, kind of a teachable moment where they recognize, hey, there are a lot of people out there that, you know, small, old, are feeling the same way that I'm feeling and I'm making a difference today um, in bringing, you know, some kindness um, to their lives. And it's a great segue because I know my, my friend Bev um, has pivoted and has been doing a pretty regular segment on Kindness Matters. And so talk a little bit about um, your folks and the lack of, you know, opportunities and maybe touch a little bit about the Homeless Map Partnership. Sure, so um, Integrate for Good has one leg in the school-based system and one leg in the adult-based system. So we straddle those worlds. Um, so what, prior to COVID, we were 100% community-based. Our organization does not have brick and mortar. Um, so every day we were out in the community um, at 
senior centers, um, corporate events, you know, Northwestern Mutual, Nationwide, Dow, and we had our neurodiverse leaders leading corporate engagement for people in those companies. So people with Integrate for Good, no one helps anyone with a disability. People with disabilities and people who are neurodiverse are the leaders. So we spin that 180. Um, we were 100% virtual. So uh, we had about 48 hours to become 100%. I mean, we were 100% in person. Well, 48 hours later, we were 100% virtual um, because we knew we'd either have to kind of be a turtle in a shell and pull that head in and wait it out. But we know the needs are too great and that wasn't gonna be an option for us. So we took everything that we were doing in the live space and created a virtual format for that. Um, thanks, shout out to Zoom who uh, donated the platform for us to do this work. And we have um, a series called Kindness Isn't Canceled and I'll talk about this Sleepy Map project here. Um, we have 14 different projects going on seven days a week, morning, afternoon, evening, Saturday morning, Sunday mornings, um, about kindness, being, kindness is not canceled. So many things are, kindness isn't. Um, so we have kindness to yourself where we're teaching students apps for mental wellness, apps to track your steps, you know, apps to get outside and you know, walk safely around your own neighborhood, detox from that screen. You know, we, want, we always care, Integrate for Good uh, research is based on the social determinants of health for people with disabilities, that physical and mental health and how social determinants affect it. So um, our Sleeping Map project, I'll just use as an example. We were getting together all over the community, recycling bags, creating sleeping mats for people experiencing homelessness. You know, that was a very touchy project, we realized. <laughs> we were sharing supplies. We were, you know, you cut the strips and give them to me and I'm going to make a ball of plastic yarn and then I'm going to pass them to this student who's now weaving on the loom. Everyone had a piece of the project that fit their abilities, their strengths, their interests, their passion. Nobody can touch all that now. So what we do, similar to what Nikesha is doing, we are, you know, mobile. So anyone who wants to be involved, we arrange contactless pickup in parking lots of all different community businesses. People will put things on their front step. You know, someone will say, I have a lot of bags to donate. And I'll say, I know a student who's, you know, loving to cut those bags up. And some of the repetitive work in our projects really calms the anxiety. Mm -hmm. So... We're keeping all those projects going. Homelessness actually is seeing, seeing an up, uptick um, in Narstown, in Philadelphia. Um, so we want to make sure that, you know, we're not going to stop what we're doing. We're just going to figure out a new way to do it. And even though people are working from home, helping people to realize that they're still part of something bigger. Absolutely. And this people are a lot, of, a lot of creativity and thinking differently these days, but it can still happen. People are cleaning out like crazy and reorganizing. And I, I know it takes 8,000 bags to make, right? One of those. Oh, 800. 800. 800. Oh, see. I'm always off on math. Still a lot. It's still a lot. Math. <laughs> we wouldn't make too many maths that way. Um, yeah, we, you know, people have been donating bags on my front step. You know, I got a call from, you know, and it's all ages. What we used to think were special needs, the need to belong, the need to feel included, the need to work, you know, the need to, have someone miss you if you don't show up the need to be to have someone excited when you do show up like those aren't special needs they're human needs yeah um, and so i think you got to get on that seniors right other people the needs of transition age youth are sometimes unique but they're sometimes not and, and we can just, address their needs in a holistic way looking at our community yeah. and you just touched on something major because what happened with us once we went out of that work-based learning portion our work-based partners were calling me, hey, what about this kid? I can't do anything for you. What if I hire them and pay them? Here are their parents' telephone numbers. Please feel free. And um, that is how we now have so many of our students working for financial gain um, because they're so well-known in the community and we have taught them so well where our partners were actually missing what we call our free labor for community work-based learning partners. And now we have six kids who are working and getting a paycheck, which increases that level of independence and builds that socialization as well as the self-esteem to walk away weekly with a paycheck. 
Yes. That's incredible. Now, competitive you know, wage is not a, you know, a special needs or a menial wage, but a $13 yes. an hour job or $11 an hour job, where again, we were providing that free labor. So they have the socialization, they have the self-esteem building, they have all of that to go with what we're all trying to work together to do. You both have shared so uh -huh. many um, strength-based approaches to caring for both physical and mental health and socialization. Um, I wanna kind of close today by focusing in on some tips. We kind of incorporated them into our discussion, but let's talk about the tips, not only for the transitional age youth, but you know, I'm sure you're both getting a lot of calls from families that don't know where to turn, what to do, what are you doing to give them hope and structure and keep things moving during this challenging time? Yeah, I think structure is huge. <laughs> I think it's huge for all of us <laughs> needing a reason to get out of bed in the morning, right? Um, you know, so some of the things we share are not unique to COVID. They're things that we've shared all along that are even more important during this time. Um, so harnessing passion. We support a lot of people on the autism spectrum, for example. And often I'll find that those students um, and adults have something they care a lot about. Um, you know, a quick example, and we, we showed the picture here earlier, um, one of our students um, who actually uh, graduated last year, so he's now one of our adults, um, he has a passion for Disney, all things Disney. He knows when every movie was released in HD, like he is a Disney expert. Um, but too often he's been told, it's not time to talk about Disney right now, you know, off topic, you know, redirect, behavior plan. Um, and we really have, Integrate for Good is a much different approach to that. We respect that. We have a much different approach. So we harness that because that is talent. That is, that is something that can really, it's fuel. Um, so we use his passion for Disney to reduce stigma around smaller children with, without disabilities to realize what they have in common with people with disabilities. So we say, you know, what is your son or daughter? What do they not want to be interrupted when they're doing something? What is that thing they love? And how can we translate that? So very similar to the discovery process that OVR, Office of Vocational Rehabilitation, Office of Development Programs uses in the adult-based world. How do you grab that passion, translate it into competitive, meaningful, integrated employment? The best, there are two indicators of whether a student is going to be employed post-graduation. And those two indicators, based on a lot of research, are expectations of their family and their team. And then also this idea of how they had workplace learning experiences prior to graduation. And when they're paid experiences, they're much more likely to be paid experience post-graduation. That's um, perfect. So, Before we move to the next one, I, yeah. Nikisha, I just think of our, our friend Jack and his yeah. acumen for Special Olympics and how you paired him with the library in Upper Dublin. Yes. And then I know he also worked with um, Department of Recreation for Upper Dublin Township because yep. you recognize that same thing that, that Bev is talking about. Yep, to make sure that they're integrated within the community and where they have a high level of interest, yep. Great. All right, how about another, another tip? Yeah, and Nikisha just said it. <laughs> Environmental go. fit, you know, that's me talking as an occupational therapist, right? But it's, it's something that's so important. You know, we look at things like sensory preferences. Some of the people we support have neurodiverse sensory preferences. Are they going to work in a big, noisy environment? Are they going to want to work, you know, with certain lighting, with certain sounds? All those things we consider so that it's a fit where someone feels comfortable and then they can grow and succeed. Absolutely. I love it when a young person tells you, I don't really like being around kids. You know, I like a quiet office and that we can often to be a good fit for that environment in not providing a lot of direct service. It's not so busy and hectic. Makes sense. Yep. Yeah, this last one is huge. Um, it's, a, it's the reason I, I found it Integrate for Good, really. And it's, I see so many so many people underestimated. They might be underestimated because they're nonverbal. We work with a lot of people that communicate in ways other than words. Um, 
you know, I can't imagine what it must be like to go through life where somebody kind of puts you on a certain trajectory because of some standardized testing that you took um, or their assumptions about what you can do and what you can be. So we want to make sure that, you know, just like we ask people without disabilities as children, what do you want to be when you grow up? So often kids with disabilities aren't asked that question because people are afraid to ask the question. Right. They're afraid of what could be, and they might have their own limited thinking about what could be. So we want to make sure that, you know, we're leaving that wide open and helping people figure out like, where are my interests? You know, what kinds of things can I try? And it's just as important for people to try things and realize that they don't want to do. We've all done that. You know, few of us are in the jobs we started out in, right? Um, and giving kids those experiences helps them kind of narrow down and kind of cross off some things <laughs> and then move closer to what they do want to be doing. Well, and I think that kind of vision also gives parents in particular who, who that are wondering what is this next phase of adult life going to look like for my child post-education. And I'll piggyback off of that last one. We have a student who is nonverbal. She works on a, um, a technological device and we paired her with Ambla Flowers last year as um, a rose stripper to take the thorns off the roses. And beginning to start off a little, you know, and our kids are out for about an hour and a half, two hours. She worked her way up to about 200 roses per hour. So here's a student who was nonverbal, who's not able to articulate what she really wanted to do. But when I tell you, we went to change her site and Jean said, no, 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 no. I need her for Valentine's Day. Please don't take her away. Um, she is, faster than my typical employees in stripping the thorns off of roses. And we found her niche in a horticultural world and had no idea that she even, because it wasn't something she articulated on her device. And so never underestimate, because again, we didn't think it was going to be a fit for her in the beginning. And she misses it so much. And she will go back once we're able to go out into the real world again. Love it. I know your tips were pretty similar. Is there anything else that you wanted to add, Nikisha? No, I would just say exactly what Bev said, because again, our students are able to do exactly what a typical um, person's able to do. We just have to make sure that we own into what they really enjoy doing and nurture that enjoyment. And again, with some of our students who's out there who are actually working gainfully employed, we nurtured what they're able to do. And this way, again, I go back to that same parent the day I walked into Upper Dublin. Said, I want my students to, you know, work in the industry. I don't want them to be clients. And our students are working in industries. They're not clients of just OBR and the Office of Developmental Disabilities. They are out in the community and they're working and they're engaged. And that is the biggest piece that parents and caretakers can take away um, from all of your foundations is to make sure that we're nurturing these young people to go out and be who they are deemed to be. Yeah. yeah. Then the whole, you know, then the whole community benefits, you know, like as Ambler Flores benefited from, you know, we tell people don't hire someone who's neurodiverse because of charity mindset or because of pity. You hire that person because they're going to impact your bottom line. Absolutely. Because they are good for business because they have skills and abilities that are going to elevate your work in your industry when it's a right fit. Um, so that's really the message we want to tell. Not only does it benefit families and students and adults with disabilities, it benefits all of us when we have a diverse workforce. Yes. Well, I want to thank you both, commend you both for being, you know, community mobilizers and not letting a little old pandemic stand in the way of opportunity and engagement and supporting um, these folks. So thank you for being uh, my guest today. Um, Bev, if you just want to give a shout quickly how people could get a hold of you at Integrate for Good. Sure. Um, so here's our website. And I am proud to say that we employ a young man. He is totally just turned 21. Um, Nick Welsh, he does all of our IT. He does my website design, back end of our website. I would never be where I am without him. Um, he's been on board with me since the very beginning. Um, so visit, I say visit our website just to say, see Nick's work, if nothing else. Um, but integrateforgood.org, the first thing you'll see on our website is kindness isn't canceled. Right now, all of our events are free. Um, so people, that's a way that transitioning students 
and families can be involved, you can attend. We have one hour sessions and you'll see our whole schedule. Um, all the whole community is invited to participate that you just have to register so we can keep our zoom link secure and November 13th we hope you'll join us for World Kindness Day a big celebration with Jake Olson who is the first le uh, not legally blind he lost both eyes to cancer completely blind division one college football player played for USC as a long snapper the story will blow your mind so we hope you'll sign up join us on November 13th you'll find all that at integrateforgood.org I'll be there. Can't wait to hear Jake. Me Thank you both. Very rich conversation. Very important topic. Tremendous resources um, that will help a lot of people and families. So thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good one.